Psalm 119, let's go to verse 33, and we'll read this next section of the longest psalm in the Bible, all about the Bible, and coincidentally, somewhere right around halfway through, if you look at it, practically speaking, kind of in the heart of the Bible. Psalm 119, verse 33, Teach me, O Lord, the way of thy statutes, and I shall keep it unto the end. Give me understanding, and I shall keep thy law. Yea, I shall observe it with my whole heart. Make me to go in the path of thy commandments, for therein do I delight. Incline my heart unto thy testimonies, and not to covetousness. Turn away mine eyes from beholding vanity, and quicken me in thy way. Now here's the, the title for the service to the sermon this morning. This is the verse that gave me the thought. Establish thy word unto thy servant, who is devoted to thy fear. Turn away my reproach, which I fear, for thy judgments are good. Behold, I have longed after thy precepts. Quicken me in thy righteousness. Father, we ask you this morning to bless the preaching now. Speak to our hearts. Guide me, I pray, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. Now, there's a difference between the word established and the word establish, like you see in verse number 38. He says, establish thy word unto thy servant. But if you go ahead and look up the references in your Bible, you'll find out that a lot of times God uses the word establish. They're essentially the same word, but they don't have the exact same meaning. That's why we believe every word of God is pure, and we don't believe in changing one word at all anywhere in our Bible, because God's got that thing written in such a way where you can get advanced learning, advanced wisdom, and advanced knowledge above and beyond your capability of figuring out in one lifetime. If you'll study His word and allow His word to guide your life, that Bible will make a change in you and do some stuff in you over the years that could never get done without your Bible. I promise you that. So trust your Bible. When God says established, that's what he means. If you all remember back when we bought our second house that we're in right now, I think it was about five years ago or so, you got together as a church and you bought us a rock. Anybody remember that? And on that rock you had engraved Reagan family and you put EST.2002. That sits on my front porch to this day. I like that rock. I've become real fond of that rock. I was actually walking over across the street to put the neighbor's dogs back, and when they're out of town, we watch their dogs and all that stuff, and I'm walking them dogs over there to put them back, and I turn around, as I'm walking back down there, they got a real long driveway, and I can see my house from there, and I'm walking down there, I'm looking at my house, and I see that rock sitting there on that front porch. You know what that rock represents to me? That rock represents Jesus Christ. It's not an idol. I've never prayed to the rock, so don't get all super spiritual on me, okay? It's, people get weird, you know? That rock represents Jesus Christ. And I got thinking about it while I'm walking down that road, and I'm thinking, Lord, it is because of you that I have a family. Yep. It is because I got saved uh, 41 years ago. I trusted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior because I knew, listen, I'm not as smart as uh, I think I am, but I'm not as dumb as most people think I am. I knew at five years old I was a sinner. I got that part. I understood that. No doubt in my mind at all that I was a sinner when I was five. There was no doubt in my mind at five years old that I deserved a five-year-old little boy. It's a little mind-boggling for you. A five-year-old little boy deserved to go to hell. In my own mind, I understood that by the convicting power of the Spirit of God, and I recognized my sinfulness and trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. You know what Jesus Christ is? He's the rock. He's the only thing that you really can build a real life on. He's the only guarantee you have for eternity. And I'm thankful that as five years old, one month before my sixth birthday, I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. Fast forward 23 years and I'm finally getting with it, finally waking up a little bit and deciding that I'm going to do with my life what God told me to do with my life. And I go off to Bible school and I meet a girl there who, guess what? She is a little girl, put her faith and trust in Jesus Christ, the rock on which he said he'd build his church, not Peter. Jesus is the rock. Very clearly taught in your Bible if you compare Scripture with Scripture. And she put her faith and trust in Jesus Christ, and because of Jesus Christ, I meet the love of my life, and I marry her. Because of Jesus Christ, we've been able for 20, almost 22 years now, real soon, to actually build a home. 
We've had children. That's a big deal. I know nowadays it's nothing. I know if you, know if you don't want it, you just get rid of it. You just chop it up before it's born, all the rest of that stuff. I get that in the messed up culture we live in, but I'm talking about something that's a, a very big deal. It's bringing children into the world having little lives entrusted to you that you're supposed to invest in to try to help them become what God wants them to be, not what you want. Your kids don't exist to suit your ego. And they don't exist for your Christmases and your Mother's Day and your Father's Day get-togethers and the rest of that garbage. They exist for God. And God's let us invest in some kids. And God's blessed us over the years in spite of us, no doubt. What happened is in 2002, we got established. What happened is when I was five years old, one month before my sixth birthday, and I can't do the math right now, whatever it was, 82 or something like that, 83, I got established. It was a day and, eight, day, day and time when I was born again. I got established in Jesus Christ. To establish is to begin something. In 2002, the Reagan family, the Michael R. Reagan Jr. family, was established. You know what God's been doing since we got established? He's been establishing us. They're not the same. To be established is to start. Back in January of 2008, the Bible Believers Church of South Lyon got established. Because God really circumstantially and, and spiritually and through the counseling and advice that I got from older preachers, God guided and directed and closed doors and opened doors and, and made it very clear to me that I was to come back to my hometown, which I did not want to do at the time, and establish a work. And the name of that church was Bible Believers Church, for which I do not repent and I do not recant and I do not back up and I will not back up and I will not budge because this thing from the beginning was built on one thing and that is the preaching and teaching of the Word of God without apology, without compromise, without doubt. It is utter and absolute faith that God gave us a book and what we need is the Word of God and what our generation needs is the Word of God and what lost souls need is the Word of God and what saves souls needs the word of God and what little souls downstairs need is the word of God and what old souls upstairs need is the word of God and you're never going to stop needing the word of God. Amen. God allowed us to establish a church and there's a lot more that goes into it than just you know hanging up a shingle and here we go everybody come because you can establish a work but that doesn't mean that work is established. He says in the passage establish thy word unto thy servant who is devoted to thy fear. A lot of people start out right, but they don't finish well. A lot of people get established, they get saved, but they never get established. They never continue to be firm and settled and strengthened and growing in the word of God. I'm so thankful for all the souls we've been seeing get saved, man. It's such a blessing. I asked God this morning for a soul today. I want one, I just want, I want one every week. I'm like, I'm like a rabid pit bull when you give him a little bit of bloody meat. He's just like, ah, he can't stop. You understand what I'm saying? Like when somebody gets saved, I'm just like, man, I love that. I want to see more people saved. And by the way, you guys are doing a phenomenal job of bringing them. You know why so many people are getting saved? Because you're not waiting until you have all the answers and you know it all to bring people to church. You're just telling them best you can what the Lord's done for you. And be like, I can't answer all your questions, but come on, my preacher likes answering questions. And that's why they're getting saved. So keep doing what you're doing. Don't wait till you have all the answers to start being a witness. What a blessing it is to see people get saved. Listen, it's a wonderful thing that you got saved because you got established eternally. Do You do understand that, right? You're not going to hell now. But what kind of life do you want to live between here and whenever the Lord comes? You know what you need now after you get saved? You need to be established. I remember my dad all the time. He, I, I, I thank God for him. The older I get, the more I thank God for him. He would talk to me from a very young age about money. And he would talk about getting established. And what, what he meant was established, but when he was saying established, he was always referring to when you start out. He would teach me this, and I, I've never forgotten this. He would say, you have to do one of two things. You either have to make more than you spend, or you spend less than you make. Those are your options. He warned me about the dangers of credit cards. Man, when I first got a credit card, I was like, God's going to curse me or something. This is really bad. My future is destroyed. I think my first credit card was like a $500 limit or something, you know. Now they're like, how much do you want? You're the devil. <laughs> but we had to get 
established. And we would see, you know, our friends like every Sunday, all the other people, they're going out to dinner and they're going on vacations and my dad would say, we're going to go home and eat. Dad, and you're eating your granola because this morning you didn't want to finish your breakfast and remember we put your granola in the fridge? You guys know what happens to granola when it sits in the fridge and milk all afternoon? It's mush. It's gromusha. It's something like that. It's really, really it's, it's the texture. It's just, you feel like you're eating, excuse me, pu puke. You know what I'm saying? Like, sorry about that. I'm trying to get classier. I'll get there, okay, you guys? I'm sorry. It's disgusting. I'm like, well, why can't we go out to dinner? He'd say, son, you know what you got to do? You got to get established. And as you get established, you can start doing some of those things later. But for now, you just, you just don't. Right. You know what that was? That was really good training for me. All that stuff as your little kid, you know how kids hardly ever listen to their parents? You guys ever notice that? And you keep kind of putting into them and putting into them putting into them. It's like you feel like it's all going like this. And then somebody else comes along who's, of course, your peer, but to them it's an old guy. And the old guy says the same thing you've been saying a hundred million times and it clicks for him. And then they're crediting the old guy all the time. Can I get a witness? And you're like, I know I'm an idiot and all the rest of that, but I've been telling you that your whole life's stupid. <laughs> Brother Lentz came along and he said something that just stuck in my head and I never forgot it. He said, you can't start out where mama and papa finished. And I was like, oh man, that's great wisdom. And it clicked. But you know why it clicked? It clicked because somebody had been establishing me for years. And it would have never clicked later when God sent another witness along if somebody hadn't been investing in me and establishing me for years. To be established is a good thing. You know where I think we're at as a church? I think we're established. That's a blessing, man. I mean, I know you walk in here and look around, and if you're not familiar with what's going on, you might feel like, you know, so many new people. We've had plenty of people come through here that walk in, like all the newer Christians in this church. Most Bible-believing churches are pretty well established, and they've been around a long time. Everybody's been saved a long time. They all know the answers. And you're like, who's that preacher, and who's that preacher? And you don't know all the ins and outs of the Bible-believing circles. And they come in and think, well, we're going to go help Brother Reagan out with all those new Christians. And what they find out pretty quick is this church is a little more established, a little more established than we thought. You know what God's been doing? He's been putting a framework in here. He's been establishing you in the Word of God. He's been helping you get your bearings and understand how you're supposed to live your life and what you're supposed to do and not do and how to go about it and what God expects out of church and doesn't expect out of church. It's the establishing power of the Word of God. And listen, it's not your preacher not trying to take credit. God help me, I'm afraid of him. It's the fact that we preach the Bible and give you Bible one week at a time, week after week, month after month, year after year, and we're almost to the end of the second decade. And what God's been doing through the power of the Word of God is He's been establishing your life. You know what you need? You need to be established. And what I want to submit to you this morning is that is not a one-time process like getting established is. It is a continual process throughout the Christian life that you have to be committed to in order to continue producing fruit for God. In order to not make a train wreck of things. So I'm telling you, every one of us, listen to me, I'm not trying to be mean. Every one of us has all the ingredients it takes to destroy our own life. I am so fed up with the humanism of our day and age. People are not inherently good. And it's not the devil that's the problem. It is sinful human nature. This afternoon we'll be looking at it. In the millennial kingdom, the devil is locked up and the devils are locked up. And Jesus Christ himself is ruling and reigning on a throne visibly in Jerusalem. And he's blessed the earth so much that the, that the sower overtakes the reaper because the ground is so fruitful. And there's a bunch of wicked rebellion going on in that kingdom in the future. Without the devil, it shows you the sinfulness of human nature. Give me this garbage that we're inherently good people. Give me this garbage that if there's anything good in my life, it was Mike Reagan that did it. I don't believe that. I'm trying to tell you this morning that if there's anything good in my life, it is because of a commitment to the Word of God and a, and a constant staying in that book and a begging of God to show me the truth about myself and to guide me and direct me. And I constantly, hey, hear me, constantly. 
constantly has to keep changing. I'm not talking about compromising truth. I'm talking about changing. As life changes, as this church changes, as my family changes, like Miss Grace told you ladies at the, at the wedding shower thing, as life changes, as spouse changes, as you change, as times change, you have to learn to change with it or you won't be established according to the Word of God. And you'll start destroying your life. I've seen too many mamas try to keep their babies babies. And then you wonder why they can't stand you and you have no influence in them when they get older. Maybe you're the problem. I've seen too many people try to keep churches the way they are. Don't make any changes. Well, and you wonder why those churches never grow. You wonder why as time goes on they fall apart. You got to learn to change. But you got to make sure the changes are under the touch of God. Go with me if you would. Keep your finger here in Psalms. Go to the book of 1 Peter if you would, chapter 5. Let me show you some New Testament passage that, that, that show you God intends for you to be established. 1 Peter chapter 5, you can't get established until you've been established. That means you have to be born again before you can begin to be established. You cannot build a Christian life without becoming a Christian, and you cannot become a Christian without obeying the gospel. You have to get saved. And if you've been saved, then you begin a nice long process that's from here to the rapture or grave. And if you'll be committed to it, God will do something in your life that will be tremendous. 1 Peter chapter 5, look at verse 10. But the God of all grace, hear what they just sang about? Who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus. After that ye have suffered a while. I don't like that. Make you perfect, do what? Strengthen and settle you. Let me show you another passage. Keep going back to your right. Stop in 2 Thessalonians. Back to your left. Excuse me. Stop in, stop in 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. God allows you to have hard times. And those hard times are meant by the devil to ruin you. Did you hear me? They're meant to fill you with bitterness and anger, and frustration, and hurt, and resentment, and confusion. And God allows the hard times and intends to use those to make you better, stronger, established, strengthened, settled. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 17, comfort your hearts. See that? Why would you need comfort without grief? Why would you need comfort without pain? Comfort your hearts and do what? Establish you in every good work, word and work. You know what God wants to do? He wants to establish you. That's not all. Look at chapter 3, verse 3. But the Lord is faithful and shall and keep you from evil. Ain't that a blessing? Oh, the coming apocalypse. Relax. You got the Lord? Do you have the Lord? Then you ought to have some comfort in your soul. You shouldn't need to turn to all the crutches the world turns to. They mock us, you know, you got, uh, your Bible's a crutch. Yeah, you're right. Your dope's a crutch. Right. Oh, no, no, it's not. Wait a second. You hypocrite. You told me my Bible's a crutch. I said, you're right. I lean on it. I need it to walk. I need it to hold me up. I need it for everything in my life. I search it for all the answers. I search it to be, a, uh, to be a husband. I search it to be a father. I search it to be a pastor. I search it to be a friend. I search it to be everything that I am. I search it to examine my thoughts. I search it to examine my heart. I want to know what my creator says about me because I want my life established according to God. I want my church established. I want it to be strong. I want it to grow. I want it to produce something good in my life and the life of people. I want it to glorify God. Yes, my Bible's a crutch, and I'm not ashamed of it. And I love the Lord Jesus Christ, and I ain't ashamed of him. Right. What crutch are you leaning on? Go with me, if you would, please, to the book of Romans. Uh, I'm sorry, first, uh, yeah, Romans. Go to Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16. You'll notice these established words that have saved people. Romans 16, 25. Now unto him that has of power to do what? Hmm. God has the power to establish you? 
according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. You know what God has the power to do? Back to Psalm 119, please. He has the power to establish you. But in order for you to have that establishing, you have to have a desire to be taught. You see verse number 33? What's the psalmist say there? Teach me, O Lord. I don't give two hoots for people that don't have a teachable spirit. I was taught years ago that people ask you questions for one of three reasons. They ask you, number one, to find out how much you know. They ask you, number two, to let you know how much they know. If your reasons are one of those two things, I could give a flip. I don't care. I don't care to show you how much I know. What good does that do me? What good, let me say it better. What good does that do you? It might do my pride some good. But what good is that going to do you to find out how much I know? I don't care how much you know. I'm not impressed. I'm sorry. It doesn't matter to me if you're brilliant or if you're not brilliant. I love you either way. Right? I'm not impressed by man's intellect. You ever notice how some of the brightest minds in the universe are absolutely idiots? I'm talking bright minds. I'm not going to take that away from them. I'm talking about high intellect, man. I'm talking about just, wow, the guy's so smart. And he thinks you came from a monkey. Yeah. <laughs> they think aliens seated you here. But they mock you for believing in God and a book that you can study scientifically and you can prove that thing more than any other thing can be proved and more ways. And they say, well, I've read the Bible. You lying dog. You lying hypocrite. You have not. It's cover to cover. Start to finish. Every word. You've read it all. Prayerfully asking God, if you're real and if you're there, show me that this is your word. And if it's not, it's not. But if it's you, if you're out there, show me. I don't care about brightness of intellect. I don't think God does. I really don't think God is that impressed by Albert Einstein or who's the guy in the wheelchair? Yeah, that guy. I don't think God cares any more than I care what his name is. I don't think he cares. I just don't, to me, that's just not even impressive. You can, they can't even figure out what the darkness out there is. The Bible tells you what it is. It's the garment of God. And we'll show you tonight, he's going to strip that garment away at the end of the millennial kingdom and you're going to behold him just like he is. And there he is sitting on a great white throne. The Bible said a great white throne. God rips this universe down like a man would take off a jacket. And there's God. And the whole world standing there in front of nothing, suspended on nothing, and they're obsessed with getting to the moon. Getting to Mars. That even if we make it to Mars, do you know what we accomplished? Nothing. nothing. I mean nothing. Yeah. You know how many galaxies are out there? Can you imagine how big God is? And all that stuff is in the Bible long before these little peons with their puny little intellects to start figuring it out. God put all that stuff in that Bible sitting in your lap and they don't have the common sense it takes to pick up that Bible and start reading through it and praying over it and asking the Holy Spirit of God to show them if there's a God out there and who you are and is this your book. Yeah. Prejudiced. Yeah. Prejudiced. Oh, you Christians are prejudiced. We are not. He that is spiritual judgeth all things. Prejudice is prejudging based on your feelings, emotions, or your personal concept. We don't prejudge nothing. You bring me everything to the, to, the, to the table, and I tell you exactly what the proper judgment is on, on it after evaluating the facts and running the references. I don't think God's impressed with intellect. You know what I think God wants to see? I think he wants to see people that desire to be taught. It's strange to me how many have come over the years that know the Bible. You know what winds up, what winds up happening with them? They're gone. I already know it all. I, I love the gotcha people. Listen, listen to me. As much as I study, as much as I preach, as much as I talk, you're going to catch me. Do you want to know how much I care? Do you know I don't, I, I don't just lightly get up and preach. I got some research to do to get ready for Wednesday night. 
you, you don't have the benefit of knowing what I'm going at to prepare your counter arguments, but I got to do some research because when I get up and preach, I really do want people to say, okay, he's not just up there shooting off his mouth. I want to make sure there's some credibility to what I say. When I, when I look at a study, I don't just Google and just read the article. You got to research who wrote it. You got to research where it came from and what kind of pools of study. You got to research the research. Do you understand what I'm saying? I don't take it lightly. But you know what I've learned over the years? When you got the gotcha people around, you mispronounce that. So what? I mean, like, big deal. You do what I do. And see if you always bat a thousand. I never said I'm the answer. I never said I'm infallible. I beg God to fill me with his spirit, prepare me and use me. I beg God this morning to let the words of my mouth that are coming out to your ears and your heart be words that God wants you to hear. That's important to me. But the gotcha people, they're not. They're important. Their gotchas aren't important. You know why? You don't have a teachable spirit. You sit there being the judge all the time. Now, I've taught you to judge what's preached, haven't I? That's why we say open the Bible and look at what I'm saying. And we run the references to show you the authority is not Mike Reagan. The authority is the Word of God. And that's why I encourage you, bring your Bible. If you got one, bring it. You know, if not, make sure what you're hearing when you're listening that I'm preaching the Bible. That's important. But the people that have the spirit of, they're there to always judge what's being said. You aren't going to make it here. I'm telling you right now, I can wait you out, man. You have, got, you have got absolutely no idea. And you know what? I'm also at a point with the Lord's help, I don't let people get under my skin with the Lord's help. Because I hope and pray that every single person gets the help that they need and the Spirit of God will soften their heart and change them because I think God's Spirit and the preaching of the Word of God can do that. I want to get mature enough someday said it recently, I'm hoping to get to the point where when somebody punches me in the face, I can walk away from it. Not there yet, so don't try. <laughs> I want to get to the point someday where even my friends, God, my enemies, God can use me to help. But I cannot help you if you don't have a teachable spirit. I'm going to start the phrase, and I'm hoping some of you can finish it by now. Every black belt, the greatest black belts in the world keep what? Now, that's interesting to me that a three-time world champion, Dana White said, if this guy takes the fight to the mat, it's over because this guy is world-class on the ground. And a three-time world champion looked at me and said, every black belt in the world, the greatest black belts in the world keep a white belt mentality and walked away. You know what he was saying? Don't get to where you think you know it all, stupid, because that'll get you killed. And if you really want to keep growing, be teachable. You know what you need to get established? To be established? Teach me, oh Lord. You got to have a desire for God to teach you. You don't, I've said it before, you don't get dry runs, do you? All right, you're old and experienced. Ever been a grandparent before? <laughs> or is this your first time? It's always a, life's full of first times. Ever been a senior citizen before? You didn't get to practice. You're going to tell me you don't need God to keep teaching you? You don't need to keep learning? You don't want to not ruin what God's given you? Well, I'm doing really good. I'm established. Great. You got established. You're just getting started. You think for a minute I can ask God to keep blessing this church if I act like, well, we're established now. No, God. No, I don't feel like we got it. Yes, we're founded on you. Yes, you got us up and running. Now, God, we need you more than ever because there's more people to get hurt than there ever was before. There's more damage to be made than ever before. There's more decisions to be made, more opportunities for failure, more opportunities for pain, more opportunities for sorrow, more opportunities for the devil to get in. God, establish thy servant. Teach me your word and guide me, please. I need help. And you need help. What's the purpose of wanting God to teach you? And I shall keep it. See it in the verse 33. Teach me, O Lord, the way of thy statutes, and I'll do what you tell me. You ever teach somebody something and then they don't do it? I love these guys that want to ask everybody for advice all the time and quote an Old Testament passage to prove it's a good way to go about it. When you're asking everybody for advice, you're getting no advice at all. 
You're getting public opinion. Most of the time you're fishing to find the person that's going to tell you what you want to know. The purpose of getting advice from the right source is to say when God shows me the truth, I am going to keep what God shows me. I'm going to do what God told me to do. I'm going to follow what God has established to me. I'm going to follow as God establishes me. I'm going to stay on the path of what God's given me, and I'm not getting off that path. And I'm telling you this morning, there will be sacrifices along the way, but if you'll make those sacrifices and be determined to keep what God's given you, listen, let me ask you a question. Did God put you in this church? Yeah. Okay. Then stay. Stay. You want to grow, right? Then stay. You know what the devil's going to do? He's going to show up and let you know why you need to move on. You know what my preacher told me? I think it was 13 times from the age of uh, uh, um, eight, uh, 17 till 30. I moved 13 times. I think it was six or seven different states I've lived in. You know what my preacher said? He said, Mike, you ain't going to go anywhere until you put your roots down. Quit being a tumbleweed. You know what my dad told me growing up? You got to put your roots down, bud. You got to put your roots down. You got to get your roots deep. You ain't going to grow if you keep uprooting. You can only transplant a plant so often and then it's going to die. But keep it. You got to get in and you got to get faithful and you got to stay faithful and you got to stick it out through the dry times and you got to let your roots run deeper. If the water's not right at the surface and easy to grab, get deeper. You'll find water. But don't uproot. The purpose of being in the Word of God is not just to learn more Bible. I'm tired of Christians that know all the Bible. I'm sick of being around Christians that always want to talk about Bible doctrine all the time because they want everybody to know what they know. And they want to debate, oh, I found something nobody else found. Good for you. Go enjoy your life. That's not helping anybody. I want to learn the Word of God and know the Word of God and understand the mind of God so that I can keep what God's given me. I want to continue in it. Look at verse 35. Make me to go in the path of thy commandments, commandments, for therein do I delight. I want to continue in and keep what God shows me. Because I delight in knowing the will of God. I delight in God's direction. I delight in it when God gives me the green light. Hey, listen, it's a blessing that God gave me a wife. You understand that? I prayed very seriously about that. I've been thinking about it a lot lately because I've told you you've got to make your prayers more specific, right? I specifically prayed for my girls to grow up and to find a man that loves Jesus Christ more than he loves them and believes the King James Bible and all that kind of stuff. And then that God gave me that, right? Forgot to add Michigan. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, you know what? I got, I, this thought hit me, because that's been on my mind a lot lately. This thought hit me. I remember when I was your age, some of you high schoolers, some of you single people, I remember as a little boy praying for whoever my wife is and whoever my children are. Man, God brought that back to my mind, and I'm not making it up. God brought that back to my mind. I used to pray about that just about daily as a kid. What a blessing, man. You know what the point is? Continuance. You know, God answered a little boy's prayer because I didn't know whoever she was, but here she was growing up in North Carolina and Missouri and wherever else they moved to, and she was being raised very similar to the way I was being raised. The first time we sat down and had a conversation, it ran for eight hours. Her ears were melted and dripping off the side of her head, and I don't even know what possessed her to continue loving me. <laughs> I'm telling you, it was an answer to prayer. When we said our vows, the purpose of those vows was to keep them. It was to continue in them. You know, in order to keep those vows, man, decades roll by. I don't look the same as I did. I don't think the same as I did. I don't act the same as I did. My personality's changed. Right. She's the same and it's just blossomed. Nothing has changed over there. It just gets better and better. Like I, just, I won't say like a fine wine because some of you will take that like, oh, he thinks we can drink alcohol. <laughs> but me? <laughs> How do I keep that, man? How do I adjust with life when you can't, you can't foresee it?
Have I made the point to you yet in this series that you need the Bible? <laughs> that you need God to teach you what you're doing right and what you're doing wrong? You desire to be taught. Number two, I want you to see a determination to have the touch of God on you. Look at verse 37. He says, turn away mine eyes from beholding vanity. We'll come back to that in a minute. And quicken me in thy way. Look at verse 40. Behold, I've longed after thy precepts. Quicken me in thy righteousness. You know what those quickenings are? That's God doing something special and personal for that individual. Has God done something special and personal for you? How about lately? If you can't say yes, you need it. You need a determination to get the touch of God on your life. It's not enough for me to live on yesterday's blessings. You know what I want? I want the hand of God on today. You know how to be, a, to be established in your life? When you got established, the day you got saved, did you not feel a quickening touch? Yes, sir. Come on, man. We don't preach a touch, right? We preach facts based on faith in the Word of God. It is what it is. God said if you repent and turn to Jesus Christ and ask Him to save you, that He'll save you. Did you do that? Yes. Best you knew how, from your heart. Then what did God do? He did what He said He'd do, right? Fact, based on the Bible. But when it happened, wasn't it kind of nice to find a little bit of a quickening touch? Wasn't that a blessing to sit back and say, man, I should have done that a long time ago. You know what you felt? You felt an answer from God. You felt a touch from God. That established you. You know what you need to be established? You need a fresh touch. Listen to me. If Elijah needed it, you need it. If Daniel, when God told us about how wise Satan was, he said, thou art wiser than Daniel. God's picking out a man and he wants to use the wisest human being. And look at Solomon. God said wiser than Daniel. At least Daniel finished right. He said, Daniel, I'm going to give you all these revelations and the more teaching that Daniel got from God the weaker Daniel got. Well, I thought as I got older as a Christian, I'd get stronger. I don't know. I don't know. I think in life it's really weird because the burdens pile on, don't they? Yeah. Ah, when we get the kids to this point, it's going to be easier. Well, it's nice not changing diapers. It's nice saying, hey, we're running behind, get dinner ready. But I ain't found it to be any easier. That's nice having a growing church, man. You have got no idea what a blessing that is, what a touch that is from God for me personally. It's such a blessing. I'm not finding it to get easier. You know what I need? I need a fresh touch from God. Because if God doesn't establish what he started, it's going to fall apart. I'm telling you, I please, please hear me. Please listen to me. You're not out of the water. I'm not out of the water. This church ain't out of the water. Your marriage ain't out of the water. Your kids aren't out of the water. You need God. Your safety, your comfort, your power, your blessing is in a fresh touch. He says, quicken me. I mean, how do you get more spiritual than the guy writing this stuff down? Man, I'm trying to memorize this chapter, and it's a challenge. I can't imagine, I cannot imagine having the touch of God on me so strong that I'm penning down these words. And while I'm penning down these words under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, I'm saying, oh God, quicken me. He must have been weak. It doesn't make him a bad Christian. It's real. And if God's real, then guess what else is real? The devil. And if righteousness is real, guess what else is real? Sin. And if God's good, guess what's bad? <laughs> Everything else that goes against God. And guess what you got in your flesh? Everything that goes against God. 
You're going to tell me you don't need the Word of God more today than you did yesterday. You're going to tell me you don't need to be established more today than you did the day before. You're going to tell me you don't need God. I'm not buying it. You need a fresh touch from God this morning. Never a day. Never a moment. Never a service ought to go by without your soul longing to be determined to hear from God and be touched by God fresh and new. He says, God quicken me. Why? Because of all the vanity coming at my face in verse 37. He says, turn away mine eyes from beholding vanity and quicken me in thy way. Have you ever noticed on your way to church Sunday morning, that's when you tend to get into a fight with the wife? Don't look at me like that. You're going to stick and make me preach in a minute. Have you ever noticed Sunday morning, hello, Saturday night, it's not a coincidence. Have you ever noticed you have a real good day on Sunday and then you get in the car and you're heading out of here and something pops up on your news feed or something pops up on your God-forsaken, godless, depraved Facebook and all of a sudden everything God just did for you is just that quick. God, turn away mine eyes from beholding vanity. And it's there, it's everywhere. It's all over. Vanity is emptiness. Haven't you noticed what this world is? Some of you think you're going to find what you want in a career. Let a guy, I'm not going to say who he is, he's with us, but oh, a year or so ago led him to Christ, and he said, Preacher, after I got everything I thought I wanted, I got a phenomenal career, I got a great education, I got it all. I didn't have this stuff growing up. And I would wanted it real bad so I could take care of my mom because the background we have and the upbringing and all that stuff. And God gave it all to me. And I thought I got my dream job. I finally made it. And he said I found out I got a strange illness that's affecting me. And I'm a young, strong guy. And he said in spite of having it all, I wasn't happy and I thought I would be. Right. You know what that is? That's life without God. You ain't going to find it in a girlfriend. Girls, you ain't going to find it in a boyfriend. I don't care if you're 15 or 55, especially if you're 55, (laughs) 75. You can forget it, man. You ain't going to find it. I'm telling you, you are not going to find it. It's vanity. A nicer house, a great car, more money. How do you know tomorrow Iran isn't going to do something stupid? Ain't it funny that the day, the day that Biden gets on the phone with Netanyahu and tells him that blah, 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 we're going to start pulling our report, God says a warning slap. You guys know what the warning slap was? Did you all miss that? Of course you missed it. The news doesn't report the truth. Run, run history. You, the United States abstains in a vote against Israel and the bridge goes down in Boston. Do you know the economic fallout and ripples that's going to happen with that? very important key port for this country. And then Biden gets on the phone and and supposedly reads in the riot act. He just walks a perfect line to make sure he makes both sides happy to get back in the office. And he gives him a warning and all that stuff. And God says, all right, you give him a warning, I'll give you a warning. And he slaps the East Coast over there in New Jersey and sends a nice little ripple and says, anytime I want, I can kill thousands and tens of thousands of you. Yeah, but the Bible's a joke, right? Nobody knows what was going on, politically speaking, when Katrina hit. I'm telling you, folks, this world's vanity. You don't know what's going to happen to the economy tomorrow. You don't know if your job will exist tomorrow. You don't know what might happen to your house. I'm obsessive-compulsive about unplugging the curling irons and shutting the stove off and all that stuff. I don't want to pull in and see my house engulfed in flames. That's a big deal, man. It's vanity. You know what ain't vain? Your Savior. You know what ain't vain? This book. That even if your house is burning down today and your job is gone tomorrow, that ain't changing. You need your Bible. You need a determination to get the touch of God, to keep the touch of God, because without the touch of God, I just don't know what you're going to do. Verses 36 and 37, he says, Incline my heart unto thy testimonies and not to covetousness. Turn away mine eyes from beholding vanity. Look at verse 39. Turn away my reproach, which I fear. 
for thy judgments are good. You know what I fear? I fear, I fear failing. Man, do I fear failing. I mean, literally, I want you to pray for me. I want you to pray for me every day. And one of the things I want you to pray for when you pray for me is pray that God will keep me faithful. I do not want, a man, listen, I do not want to destroy my life. I don't want to destroy my testimony. That scares me. Turn away my reproach, which I fear. I fear Mike Reagan. I don't fear disgruntled church members. See, I don't feel like I don't feel like you, not you, just disgruntled church members, some cranky church member. Everybody hates me everywhere I go because I'm beautiful. <laughs> <coughs> I don't think you have the power to ruin this church. I think God has the power to take care of you. You know what I fear? I fear my reaction to you. Because other people will look on and not know why a preacher is such a jerk. I've said it before and I'll say it again. If I walk up to you while everybody's milling around talking, if I walk up to one of these guys and just haul off and punch him, just thinking, knock him for a loop, Oh, there's a little over 100 people in here right now once the kids left. Maybe three people see it. Once I hit you, if you turn around and start wailing on me and we start going at it, they're all going to, did you see him hitting preacher? Right. I know. I've been there a thousand times. Yeah. I've been hit and defended myself and wound up in trouble. Yeah, Why are you beating him? Because he hit me, man. <laughs> Nobody saw that. I fear me because I feel like I can do a lot of damage. I feel like my flesh can do a lot of damage. You know what I think will establish me to make me strong and steady and keep me on the straight and narrow and help me stand when the winds of trouble and sorrow and heartbreak and disappointment and problems and issues and contention and strife all arise because they arise in life with people around you. Oh, you must be getting the point. I need this book. Lord, quicken me. Lord, establish me. Lord, help me. I got to be dedicated. I got to be dedicated to turning. Look at it and we're almost done. Look at verse 37. Turn away mine eyes. You see that? So I have to have a desire to be taught. I have to have a determination to be touched. And I got to be dedicated to turning. I mentioned it to you earlier on purpose. If you don't make a habit of changing, you will never be established. Did you hear me? You have to be willing to turn. You're going to tell me as a sinful human being, living in this sinful world, going through hard times and problems and getting knocked down, that you don't have to make changes and stay sensitive to turning? You're going to try to tell me that you're going to get hurt and you're going to go through all the disappointments and heartbreaks and sorrows of life and you're not going to get some infections in the soul. If you cut a wound open, it's going to get infected. You understand that, right? Well, how do you think you can have your heart cut open over and over and over again? The longer you live, the more it gets cut open and think you're not going to get an infection in your soul. It's called bitterness according to the Bible. It's it's some foreign things that have gotten in there because of what's happened to you and that bitterness gets created inside of you and it starts destroying you and then you start destroying everything around you. Yeah. That wasn't fair. It wasn't fair. You can't go back and change it. So you think you get the balm of Gilead and the comforting, healing hand of Almighty God and the great physician in your heart to help you out with that thing and you're going to change. You're going to turn for the better or you're going to turn for the worse. But you have to be dedicated to turning. And I recommend you turn for the better. But it's your choice. He says, God, I want you to turn away mine eyes from beholding vanity. Turn away my reproach. I want to turn from some things, and I want to turn to some things. It's not enough to turn from. That's why some Christians struggle with their sin and never quit struggling. 
all they want to do is turn from. You're so focused on the problem, the addiction, the whatever it is, the bitterness. You're so focused on that that you never get help. You got to turn to. You got to turn to God. You got to turn to His way. Verse 33. Teach me, O Lord, the way of thy statutes. Verse 35. Make me to go in the path of thy commandments. You got to turn to something. You know what else you got to turn to? Not just his way, but how about his righteousness? Behold, I've longed after thy precepts. Quicken me in thy righteousness. You ever stop and consider what the Lord's righteousness is? Talking about turning to it. Be careful. Because you know what I've done when I'm like trying to get proper judgment and evaluate the deal? God turns and shows me where I'm wrong. I can sit judge on other people's lives so easy. That is not difficult for me. But when I really, really want God to establish me, and I really desire for him to teach me, and I really, really long for and determine to get a touch from God. And I'm really dedicated to turning to get right with him and in his path. You know what he always does for me? He always shows me my 10% instead of their 90. I'm trying to help you this morning. He shows me what I need to change. And when I see the Lord's righteousness for what it is, I fear him. The problem with Christians nowadays is they don't fear God anymore. I fear him. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That's why I pray for you young people if you start messing around and dabbling around and getting rebellious and going the wrong way. I pray God get you early and get you often. Why? Because you learn to turn away from that stuff and turn to what's right. And that will establish you. Gentlemen, I'd be willing to bet you anything, 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 that if your wife is a halfway decent woman that halfway loves the Lord, and you change, you turn, you go to her and you say, I'm sorry, you're right, I've been a jerk, and just take it, just your 10%. She might actually respect you and want to follow you more. Ladies, I'd be willing to bet you that if you change, if you turn a little bit, if you'd say, you know what, honey, you're right, I'm sorry. Your husband will love you more and go easier on you and back off and start saying he's sorry. Think about it for a minute. Just talking about being willing to turn. One of the signs of the end times is that mankind, mankind's implacable. You know what that means? Okay, knucklehead, go ahead and ruin your life. I'm not trying to be mean to you. I'm your friend. I love you. You're being a knucklehead. You're going to ruin your life. You're not going to be established. You're not going to be faithful. You're not going to be strong. You're not going to get old and look back on all the troubles and trials and the ups and downs of life and say, man, God, thank you for the grace of life. And after this, I get heaven. I don't know how I could get any better. Man, you've been good. It takes the Bible to establish you. But you have to be absolutely dedicated to learning that book, determined to get a touch from God, and dedicated to turning. And if you'll do those things according to God's leading by His Holy Spirit, He'll establish you. Let's stand this morning... With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let's stand to our feet. Give you an opportunity to consider these.